Thanks for being here today. Thanks to Joe and everybody who organized this event. I'm Michael Stankoff, and I'm a, um, I'm a associate professor here at ASU. I'm over on the West Campus, though I was once here on the mothership. Um, good to be back and see familiar faces. And our, port, our panel today is Borders, Migration, and Social Justice. And um, we had three members, and one unfortunately couldn't be here. So we have two um, very, put look on the face of it to be very different papers, but I'm really interested to see how maybe they, there's more overlap than, than is immediately apparent. So our first panelist is Sarah Young. Uh, Sarah's an instructor at University of Arizona School of Information. From 2002 to 2014, she was an investigator conducting background investigations on federal employees, include Customs and Immigration Services, Customs and Border Protection and Immigration, and Customs Enforcement. This is a fascinating uh, gig to have. Um, and her research specializes in surveillance rhetoric, institutional policy, and technology. Thanks for being here, Sarah. And her paper is entitled Extreme Vetting, the Consequences of Surveillance and Procedural Rhetoric for Immigration Documents. Okay. Our second pan panelist is the Reverend uh, Ken Heinzelman, and Ken has served as the United Church of Christ Minister for 27 years. His journey has included working as a mental health caseworker, hospital chaplain, burger flipper, floor cleaner, toilet scrubber, deckhand for a barge cleaning company. His wife, Peg, has loved him and put up with him for 38 years, even though he doesn't look that old. Some days you look that old. <laughs> Some days I feel that. <laughs> uh, in that 38 years, she helped him by putting him through Murray State University to retain an ever useful philosophy degree in Vanderbilt Divinity School, um, but he never did learn to walk on water. Uh, Peg and Ken raised three big kids and are still uh, waiting for two of them to get their own phone plan, which is a real sign of adulthood in today's society. Uh, Ken currently serves as pastor of Shadow Rock UCC, not where I am a, a secular fellow traveler, and they keep him on mostly because he mildly amuses them. Shadow Rock is located in north central Phoenix, and despite its upscale location, it is a sanctuary church offering sanctuary to people with final orders of deportation. The mission of this ministry is to keep families together and keep people safe while immigration policy continues to be unjust and the enforcement of such policy increases in aggression and meanness. It is mostly a gringo congregation, but they do their best with their gringo pastor. And Ken's paper is entitled A Justice Function of Poetry. And so I'll hand it off to Sarah, get us going. I am, uh, my title is Extreme Vetting, the Consequences of Surveillance and Procedure Rhetoric for Immigration Documents. And um, Michael was saying, I was previously a background investigator from 2002, shortly after 9-11, to uh, 2014, shortly after the Edward Snowden incident. Um, kind of two caps of the, the start and end there. Um, but uh, I was retained by the United States Office of Personnel Management, some emblems to throw up here, which is kind of the, the government HR department. Um, when I was at the agency, it was part of the Federal Investigative Services. Now it has changed since the Snowden incident to the National Background Investigations Bureau. So um, it's kind of the agency within the, 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 the department within the agency. Um, but before that, um, OPM kind of contracts with different um, agencies where they'll pay OPM a certain amount of money to do their background investigations. So. Um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services are actually under OPM, uh, whereas Customs and Border Protection and uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement are two agencies that have separate, like, their own background investigations entities through which OPM is often contracted. It's kind of a long, long story, but I, I did basically the, the three, um, the, the three big those agencies. Um, so I didn't necessarily work with those agents in those agencies where I um, and privy to maybe the in-house information or stuff that um, isn't necessarily redacted at the, this point. Um, I worked enough with uh, 12 years of working with these people, kind of knowing the mindset, um, knowing the, the role of the, the forms and writing in, in the whole process of going through paperwork. Um, my own form um, was 136 pages that I would make the, um, the basically checking the checkers. I had made them go through. Um, it would take eight, 12 hours sometimes. It would take all day just to go through this form. Um, so I can't necessarily um, say that, you know, the, the two are exactly alike, but I think that um, the whole idea of I became an expert of making people fill out forms is what I feel like. So I'm gonna kind of walk through the, the 
publicly available redacted process of the, the of getting refugee um, status here in the United States, and just kind of talk about that today. Um, so, um, so yeah, the basically the outside line of my presentation is. Um, I'm kind of assuming that the, the forms and the process that you go through is a form of procedural rhetoric. Um, I'll walk through the process, and then I'm going to look at the kind of connections between procedure writing and immigration documents. Kind of a general claim I'd like to make is that the government uses these procedures to like normalize behavior and um, discipline people so that they like their actions kind of conform to how the the form um, what they need to put on the form. So, um, and I. I think my overall conclusion is literacies can help um, even a little bit um, to be informed of like a larger social situation. And um, it's uh, important to kind of evaluate the whole uh, procedure of this process because it kind of calls between like failure and success of immigration proceedings. So um, just to kind of ground this theoretically, um, I'm working with Ian Bagos's um, theory of procedural rhetoric. He is a video game scholar, surprisingly, but there's this one chapter I think is really valuable in this book from 2007 um, that uh, talks about government and procedural rhetoric. So he decide, de defines procedural rhetoric or procedurality as a way of creating, explaining, or understanding processes. Um, processes define the way things work, methods, techniques, and logics that drive the operation system. So it's kind of the processes that go to make a system. Rhetoric, he defines as refers to the effective and persuasive expression. So um, putting those together, uh, procedural rhetoric is a practice of using processes persuasively. Um, it's a practice of persuading through processes in general. And then he adds this uh, element, again, as a video game scholar or technological scholar, that is also computational processes in particular. So I think you know other disciplines may talk about bureaucracy, risk, classification, information management. But for this framework today, I'm just using procedural rhetoric um, and how ultimately, with the computational component, um, the ICBP worker becomes kind of a box checker that has to like formulate their work through certain um, certain ideas because the, there's only certain ways to pass through a computer system um, to kind of check up boxes of, of the person of the process. Um, so immigration, yeah, it's kind of uh, is, is a process that you have to follow. It's had procedural standardized rules and attempt to uniform decision making. Um, closing out a case means that you have all the boxes checked or disclaimered. Um, disclaimer is a huge word in the government field. Um, like how you, the kind of basically the reason why you haven't um, met the, the objectives of, of what you're supposed to do. So. I'm going to kind of go through the refugee screening process. Again, the publicly available refugee screening process um, so that, uh, you know, if you're any experts in the, the paperwork and actually work with the agency, it might seem slightly different. But again, um, this is the publicly available. I don't feel comfortable. Um, four years later, I'm still scared. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, you know, like, Give you any other information, or just I just kind of wanted to keep it the, what the public redacted version is. So, anyway, part of the refugee screening process has five steps. Um, the there's many other steps, but this is the simplest version. Um, it starts with a bunch of um, computer system checks, um, lookout systems, security agencies, fingerprint checks, biometric checks. Um, basically, you run through the system computerized. Um, Step number two, I'm going to just talk about in a minute, so it's not on here. Um, step number three is a controlled application and review process. Um, again, it's kind of another system that's checked to see if any national security issues are raised. Um, there's an enhanced Syria review for um, specific uh, Syrian refugees, which uh, they're not really forthcoming what exactly um, that means. And then the CBP, or Customs and Border Protection, will do like an initial review before people fly. Um, so those are the kind of the overall of the five processes. The second step is the interview. And as an investigator, this is the one that I spent my most time with. Um, so I think this is like one of the most important steps for um, a person that would be working like in immigration and customs um, services. Uh, in this step, officers conduct extensive interviews with each um, applicant um, to check on their claim for admissibility. 
they confirm biographic data, verify that the individual was given access to the refugee admissions program, um, determines if they've suffered any type of um, well-founded fear of future persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, etc. Um, sorry for that text. It's a lot to get through. Um, uh, and then they determine if the, whether the applicant is admissible in the United States or whether they've re been re firmly resettled in another country. Basically, um, supposedly the officers are well trained in the specific country that the individual is coming from so that they can um, ask intelligence based questions that um, try to find if there's, if there have been involved in terrorist activities or some type of criminal activities or something like that. So um, that's kind of the interview process. And kind of what I want to go through today is just the, the forms. Um, the information content a lot of times in these interviews is taken from these um, specific forms. We just kind of want to walk through real quickly because it helps to um, see at the end. So I've got two of the forms that they mention in this process are the I-590, which is the registration for class classification as a refugee, and then the I form I-551, which is the permanent resident card. But in order to get that permanent resident card, you need the I-485 um, form, which is an 18-page document with a 42-page instruction booklet. Um, and according to the, the policy, it says that U.S. immigration law requires refugees to apply for lawful permanent refugee status after they've been in the U.S. for one year. So um, these are kind of the forms that happen to be um, used in the process. So again, I just walked through, okay. I think I already opened it. Um, but here's the I-590 form. Um, looking at first glance, you have name, middle name, last name, present address, date of birth, place of birth, country which you're displaced, um, the reasons, state and detail, in this tiny little box, <laughs> four, four lines in a tiny little box why you, you were in state and detail, um, why you're trying to get refugee status. Um, name of spouse, present address of spouse, uh, child who went will accompany you to the United States, school or edu education, military service, political affiliation. <coughs> You're checking that you haven't been charged with a violation of law. Um, you have or have been in the United States before. So kind of these basic form or form of information that everyone, the Immigration and Customs Service officials are going to draw from um, in their interview with you. Um, Okay. okay, this one I think is a little more in depth. So I can spend a little more time with it just to kind of open both of those. Um, so here is the application for register for, for permanent residence. Um, you have your current legal name, other names used. Um, so if you've been married, um, I, I would always get a kick out of when, like, some because this was like, this is the government wants to know every nickname you've ever had. So if you were Skippy or um, Pop Bear or like something like that, like surprisingly they want to know that just in case that they interview somebody else and they say, I don't know to Bill, but I know Pop Bear, you know, and then you've got like two two different names. So anyway, so they want to know like every name that you've ever gone by. So um, other information about your date of birth. Um, we're just, I'm not going to necessarily go through all these recent immigration history, your current mailing address. They also give you the option of an alternative safe mailing address um, and all these different types of things. So you want to kind of get, skip to the additional information about you. That you have your address history, um, you have your employment history, your more employment history, your parents' name, parents' legal name, kind of, uh, information about all this information about your parents. So uh, it, again, it's an 18-page form that has a lot of information on there that you're going to need to fill out if you're trying to register for your permanent residence card. So, um, so, so then, so you have all those checks that were at the beginning, and then you have the interview and then you have the forms you have to fill out, and then if you pair this with adjudications, um, this was a, I think, very representative picture that I found. Um, if you walk to a government office, this is kind of like, this would be a representational desk. I don't think that's out of the ordinary to see stacks of paperwork on the computerized, you would think, um, 
the new ways of doing things. You still have loads of paperwork everywhere, and you think about this person. So an adjudicator um, typically is not the, the officer. Like, the officer does the investigations. They talk to the person. They know the person. They, they can kind of read the, the body language. But what's the, you put that in a report, the adjudicator gets it. You're kind of like kind of a simulation of you. You're not you anymore. You're this file. Um, so kind of removes like a little bit of the humanity, I think. So the adjudications then takes all the information that's been gathered, and then they kind of go over the, the um, information about you in two, two te different checklists. You have the adjudicative actions and then adjudicative issues. Um, the actions is, you know, did you pay a fee? I mean, you don't have to read all the whole book. Um, did you complete the form? I thought that it was interesting, you know, or complete the form correctly, accurately. Did you have anything left out? And I'll kind of get to that um, in a few slides, but any changes should be made in red ink. That's like the, the handbook address. Oh, it sounds so like great papers and um, kind of brings to mind, like, don't use red ink. Uh, but uh, so they have, did you complete the form correctly? Do you have it to verify the address? Um, they can't, uh, applicants uh, information can't be delivered to a foreign address or an unauthorized re representative. So it kind of goes back to the forms I just demonstrated, you know, that asks you for like four different, you could put like four different addresses um, down. You better make sure that one of those addresses is uh, applicable to the uh, for them. Um, then you have that they're gonna check your identity. Um, do you have, um, documentation providing reason for name change. Then they'll look at your status to see if you have prior, what your prior classification is. They'll check the, the computer system, the lookout system. Um, that kind of implicates do you have there are databases of information that are accurate, complete. But um, if you study databases or surveillance or background investigations, um, the idea that there's like a foolproof system that isn't right or wrong at certain points is, is complicated. So. So, anyway, so that was the, the kind of the adjudicative, what they call it, adjudicative actions. The adjudicative issues is um, basically, judging by the redacted handbook, the refugees need to cut ties with other countries, stop traveling, bring correct documentation, lead a non criminal life, not live with unrelated individuals also applying, and should fraudulently want to change the name for some reason. So, we have the, the kind of the checklist, and these are the kind of things that they're, I don't want to say they're trying to catch you on. But um, these are the more in-depth like um, issues that you might have, like your your file might be coded if you've um, done something bad that code you as a prior criminal record or something like that. So, so in all the, the there's all these steps and in, in to follow. So uh, my claim is, you know, yeah, the government uses procedures to kind of normalize behavior and discipline like the applicants. So there's, based off these steps, we see the government has process to follow, databases to check, questions asked, points of adjudication, and all these boxes to close before closing a case. So the applicants, I would say, are disciplined and self-controlled way to be kind of subject to these procedures and forums because um, if you kind of act outside any of the boxes that they have to check, then you won't get those boxes checked to get your, your form passed. So I think the role of writing and social justice activism is kind of um, where we kind of need some literacies. Um, and just a little background on, on what I've seen for literacies. Um, I feel like uh, if, if you don't know the system, you don't know the procedures, you might, um, it'll get overwhelming. I, I did this job again for like almost 12 years with, <coughs> I've done this process for 30 years. And it makes people so uncomfortable to sit in front of like somebody that has like changed the rest of their life. So I can imagine what it would be like to to not know like the whole process or the, the whole point of view um, or have done this before. Um, so it's kind of a scary thing. So I guess, I guess I'm seeing a need for literacies. Um, Brand Street had said that uh, literacies are shorthand for social practices and conceptions of reading and writing. So it's not necessarily just how to read and write, but knowing the social so, social processes surrounded sometimes use sort of literacies to indicate kind of like how many things are needed in order to, um, to kind of know a situation besides just learning to read or write. Um, and then I think why are literacies needed, especially in this case? Um, I'm using G's work. It says you know one doesn't think for themselves, rather than one always thinks really with and through a group that uh, group or socializes one into practice and thinking. So I'm thinking literacies can help kind of understand the group. So learning the, the literacies associated with the paperwork and the process helps maybe not necessarily 
understand the role of writing the forms, but kind of puts a group back and um, kind of puts you maybe more in the mindset, kind of seeing the whole overall picture, and then might alleviate some of the stress that just going through the process without knowing the larger picture gives. And so based on what I know of the forms and kind of um, the idea of literacy, I use um, Selber's framework for multi-literacies in the for an immigration age, I'd like to call it. Um, functional literacy, so there's a couple literacies you would need in order to understand this process, his language, you know, um, can you read the form, interpret what it's saying? Like, I can't even, I mean, the 42 page help booklet for the one form, I, I, I didn't understand it. And then, you know, I've, done, I've been associated with these people, I'm like, anybody that hasn't even, um, I, anyway, um, it's a very complicated form. Um, digital literacies, they're gonna be able to navigate the computer, what happens when you run out of room on a form. Um, the refugee form, the first one I showed you, you know, has um, name of spouse, but it doesn't necessarily have the, the name of your previous spouses. And if the, the thing about multiple paperwork asking you the same thing is if you spell one wrong on one page and one wrong on the other, or you make a, a, your date of birth different, now they're discrepant. So um, they, people spend time checking the paperwork. So you have to have some type of digital literacies and some access to a com computer, um, rhetorical, skills or maybe persuasive dimensions of the process and how they relate to each other, you know. What are the forms proceeding, persuading you to write? I give like the example, they ask you where you've lived the past five years. And um, one of the big things when and when I was doing paperwork is that, you know, you say you moved out July, you can put dates of residence where July or it's 7-18 to you know, 818, so you're saying you live there a year, but if you were to put, if you're in, in your head, you move out on July 31st, and you move in on August 1st, you might put, you move in in July and put, move out in August, but then on the paperwork, you now look like you have gap, because it looks like you have somewhere you've lived between July and August. Um, so, it's kind of like, what is the system asking you for? It's almost a, kind of a lose-lose situation. Um, because then if the, the dates also overlap, then it's like, well, did you live at two places at the same time? Um, and then you have the idea of like the couch surfing. You know, if you're staying two weeks at your uncle's house um, before you move somewhere else, does that constitute a, a, an address? If you're a refugee and you don't have an address for a certain point, how are you gonna put an address down if you don't have an address? So anyway, um, so you also need to know the system, how do the different pieces interact, where the databases, what's, um, what are the forms for adjudications, and then you also need to know some type of critical literacy, or I think it's important to, you know, why are, why are these steps important? Um, sometimes when you're in the process, it's just kind of like, why are they making me do this? But a little bit of a systemic idea, I think, at least gives you a window into what, what um, you're doing or why you're process, doing the processes. Um, who's reviewing your file? Um, I, anecdotal, I remember talking with Peter <laughs> um, about uh, people getting a job one time. And I kind of thought, that's, you know, type of two investigators. You know, there's some reasons why people choose to, um, or there's some inve officers, investigators, that look for reasons to include a uh, person, and some of that look for reasons not to include. So it depends on what mindset you're going in. Are you trying to, to you know, welcome everyone, or are you trying to put out as many people as you want, and maybe only a few kind of get in? So I think, like, what kind of investigator do you have as far as critical errors? So, so, in my part, I'm, I'm not necessarily, I, I don't, I'm not involved in the, the communities anymore. As, as soon as I left the government, I have, I've been in, under a rock <laughs> for the past four years. You know, so I'm not exactly sure where to start. I just know that I feel like I'm a paperwork expert um, at a certain time, and I, I know how to, I know there's so many gray areas in the paperwork to fill out that um, sitting in front of somebody with no ability to exist in a gray area is hard and it's terrifying, and as somebody that, like, looks through that lens, it's hard to be on that side and say, you know what, I know I can understand your situation, but there's no leeway to do this. There's no gray area. So um, the procedurality is built in to have systemic um, results and comparable, and everyone has to do the same thing, basically, to, to check these boxes. So um, I, it's not a panacea to say, you know, if we, if you know more about this, then you're, it, everything's gonna be fine, because you know, if you're denied, access then you're, you're denied but um, I guess I was just hoping to share a little bit of my knowledge um, about the government 
be an academia and kind of um, show how um, the systems relate. And last word, kind of about the extreme rhetoric or rhetoric of extreme betting. Um, I think this blows my mind, the whole idea of extreme betting. Because um, I think if, if you've looked at the other paperwork, you've already seen the quite extremes, in my opinion, of how many checks and, and how much information they need. But they were saying that, you know, we're going to do enhanced review of biometric and biographical data, improve intelligence streams, more documents and verification, um, and then more, basically more checks. And then the, they add for the Syrian refugees that this also includes home country reference checks. I can't even imagine, like, are you going to send an investigator to knock on doors to make sure that this person lived here, you know, two years ago? Um, I just, I, to me, I, 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 the, the rhetoric of extreme betting is hollow and empty, especially for people that have, um, sorry, you know. <laughs> but um, it's a very complicated matter that I think that uh, the idea of extreme betting needs more, um, more interrogation into it. So, Conclusion part one, basically um, all these procedures are there to eliminate gray areas and that's what I think we mostly live in. Um, the procedure does help see how immigration um, agents do act, why they act in certain ways. They don't necessarily have the leeway and that can also be used to you know, show how there's a narrative about what's right and wrong from immigration. Um, so, all right. I think I think I'll stop with part one. I think I just keep going on and on. So sorry about that. So all right, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good meeting. <coughs> um, I want to say thank you to Michael for his trust in me. He doesn't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so uh, a justice function of poetry. And one sterile uh, definition of poetry is the art of rhythmical composition written or spoken for exciting pleasure by beautiful, imaginative, or elevated thoughts. Uh, I think that's a terrible definition of poetry. And certainly the value of poetry in a society has been debated for a long time. It's interesting, uh, Sarah, uh, Plato, through his avatar of Socrates, argued that poetry as a form of rhetoric is, uh, is very limited and uh, at times can be misleading. And Plato may have preferred the analytical and dialectical processes to finding truth. But from time to time, even Plato slipped into, um, into loose poetic verse and image in order to speak of the deeper truths that prose could not quite capture or convey. And so prose gives us precision, or maybe not, uh, but poetry offers a new world. To quote Dylan Thomas, a good poem helps to change the shape and significance of the universe, helps to extend everyone's knowledge of themselves and the world around them. When I speak of poetry, I'm speaking less about the literary form and I'm speaking more about its function. Poetry pulls us to the greater heights and depths of what it means to be human and what it means to live in right relationship with one another and the world. The Judeo-Christian literature has a distinct claim to what it means to live in right relationship to others and the world and that right relationship in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that right relationship is justice. The Judeo-Christian literature uses poetry to inspire a justice challenge to the unjust practices of the political and religious power. So do we understand this justice narrative? And in such an ancient narrative, is it relevant for today? And can such a narrative translate to the social justice issues of today, specifically to immigration? My proposal is to affirm that the justice narrative and the poetic images of the ancient Judeo-Christian wisdom are relevant and the narrative is acutely applicable to the issues of immigration 
and the broken, unjust immigration system. I depend somewhat on theologian and biblical scholar Walter Bruggeman for what I share with you. And like Bruggeman, I think the place to start is the concept of land and our relationship to land. The identity of the Hebrew people began as a homeless people of a homeless God. The nation of Israel was not always a nation with boundaries. Originally, they were homeless, displaced, either migrating or wandering. We can learn from Israel's homeless episodes lessons about our own place in today's society. Just as Israel was a homeless people of a homeless God, so the human condition is one of all of us being a homeless people of a homeless God. There are different ways of being homeless and displaced. You can be a sojourner, you can be a wanderer, you can be an exile. Each way of being homeless brings with it an orientation toward life that is a spirituality. And each way of being homeless brings with it a distinct awareness of a way that God is present. If you do not believe in God, that's okay. It's just a it's just as valuable to change the sentence to read, each way of being homeless brings with it a distinct awareness of the way life is. This is bordering on a poetic shift in itself, as I refer to the function of poetry. But back to the ways of being homeless. The sojourner moves through the world with hope as they move from where they were to where they are going. God is present as one that stands in their future, calling them to the next best thing. Another way is to say that God is hope. The wanderer moves to the world with trust, not knowing for sure where they are going. God is present to them as the day-to-day -day provider so that in that day they lack nothing. Another way to, see, to say it is that God is trust, and trust in the deep goodness of life. However, it is the exile in the biblical text that brings out most profoundly the justice narrative, which in turn is most powerfully conveyed in poetic images. The people of Israel eventually found a promised land a promised home, and they were grounded in land and promise. Insofar as they lived in the land, understanding that it was a gift to be shared, they were living in the ways of justice for all people, including the migrant, the widow, and the orphan. These people are named specifically because they represented the most vulnerable people. The most vulnerable people in the land were to be treated with justice and they were the ones in need of the most restorative justice. However, when the people insisted that the land was no longer a gift to be shared, but instead a commodity to be hoarded, they forgot the most vulnerable, and they forgot the covenant which demanded and depended on justice. Poetic proclamation was the work of the prophets that challenged the greedy, hoarding power of kings and the way kings ruled. And by the way, one of the ways that kings rule is with a lot of paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> Before they even went into the land, they stood on the river boundary edge and were told and warned what their priorities should be. When things are good, it's easy to forget who you are where you have come from. It is easy to forget to be humble, to be kind and just when you think that all that you have is the result of the work of your own hands. It is easy to forget that life imposes boundaries and limits on us when we think that we are the ones making the world in our image. When we forget, then we act as if our own interest and our own needs tip the scales of justice in our privileged favor. This is a human tendency. 
and it is a tendency that goes against the divine purpose. Thus our injustice leads to our unraveling until we are barely a remnant people ourselves. So, a poetic image is offered through the text that is not exciting pleasure by the offer of imagination, an elevated vision of beauty. Instead, what is offered and is kind of disgusting, I quote from Leviticus, quote, and if you defile the land by forgetting our covenant and to be a just people, the land will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. How's that for poetry? <laughs> and this is what happened to Israel. They interpreted their exile as being vomited because of their injustice. The historical events are presented as big empires conquering little empires, and the people are carried off into exile from their homeland to slavery in a foreign land. The people once again become a homeless people of a homeless God. The historical events are one thing, but the prophets are telling us what such historical events mean. Their words pull us into greater heights and depths of what it means to be human and what it means to be in right relationship with others and the world. The prophets are first and foremost poets. And their poetry has a justice function. Is such an ancient narrative relevant for today? Can such a narrative translate to the social justice issues of today, specifically to immigration? I invite us to think that just as Israel forgot who they are, sojourners, wanderers, exiles, where they came from, oppression and slavery, and who destiny called them to be, that is a light for all nations, so many of us in our privilege have forgotten who we are, where we come from, and we have forgotten our calling. Also Israel forgot that the land was a gift to be shared. After all, the prophets would say, remember your humble roots and vulnerability. So as citizens of the United States, despite our rhetoric of my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, we have forgotten that the land is gift to be shared. Instead, our vision is clouded with racism and ethnocentrism that gives rise to the song, this is my country, and the subtext is my country, but not yours. When we forget that every day and all that is in every day, and this includes the geography we live in, when we forget that all is a gift to be shared, then we slip into a demonic spirituality that demands that every day and everything in it is a commodity to be hoarded. A spirituality of hoarding is full of self-centeredness and fear. This is the spirituality of policy like SB 1070. This is the spirituality of our anti-immigration policy. This is the spirituality of immigration and customs, enforcement, aggression, vindictiveness, and punitive tactics. The foundation of the laws and policy is a forgetfulness, a hoarding of self-centeredness, and a fearful hoarding as if there is not enough goodness to share. Bless you. It's what I do. <laughs> when Israel forgot justice, the poetic and prophetic word gave the people the image that they would be vomited out of the promised land. With this image, will it work for us? Are there prophets among us who will speak truth to power and say, despite all the unjust deportations, Ultimately, we, the oppressors, will be the ones vomited out of the land. 
that we hoard. It's a question that we ask. Now just a word about the spirituality of the exile. An exile moves through the world with grief and sorrow for what is lost, for what is left behind. An exile moves through the world with grief and sorrow for the gap between what life is and what life can be. And this is the spiritual foundation for political activism. The late Rabbi Edward Friedman believed that the most important event in a person's life is their birth. But the most important event in the life of a family is a death. Because in a death, all those people that held themselves together can come apart. And all those people who were apart can now come together. Everything changes. Israel's history died when they were conquered and brought into exile. And they ceased to exist as a nation and went into exile. All of their identity and their relationships were up for grabs, including their relationship with God. When Israel was conquered, their history as a nation ended. And their history as an exiled people began. There were aspects of their faith and life that ended, but the same prophets that spoke of the end also gave a word of hope about a new beginning. The people of Israel were encouraged by the prophets to see themselves as homeless people with a homeless God once again. And they were encouraged to be happy and prosperous and work for the welfare of a foreign power a new history, and a new faith began. Human historians pretty much agree that when a nation dies, their history dies. However, poets and prophets assert that humans are not the ultimate writers of history. God, or life, always doing a new thing in the midst of history, using the poetry of the Bible allows me to drive the point home. The one who tears down builds up. The one who plucks up also plants. God is the one who calls into existence those things that do not exist. The one who is barren will give birth. The one who takes slaves and makes them bearers of freedom has the last word. The one who takes the desperately hungry and poor and puts good news in their hearts and proclamations of hope and justice out of their mouths are the true power workers. God is the one who takes homeless, and hopeless exiles and promises that their treasures will be restored. The one who is crucified does not stay dead. The one that makes history end makes a new one begin. This is the experience of the sojourner and the exile of the wanderer, of the migrant, and really their experience is not all that different from ours. When we look deeply, we look closely, and we share. History may say a lot about human events and the human spirit. However, for the poet, the most significant questions are about the nature of life. It is about the capacity of our God, however you understand God, to do a new thing when all we know is ended. In my denomination in the United Church of Christ, we say God is still speaking. 
That doesn't mean that we hear God the same way Pence claims to hear Jesus. But do we really trust the word about life? That it will shatter the silence at the end of history? Do we really trust the word about life to shatter the nothingness at the end of life? Do we trust that God and our life itself has the power to overcome the forgetfulness, the self-centeredness, and the fear that creates perversions like SB 1070? Can God speak a poetic new way of being into being itself? The stories of the sojourner, the wanderer, and the exile affirm that indeed God did, God can, and God will. It is the same question asked by the wanderers in the desert. Can God create a paradise in the wilderness? And the answer to their story, they answered it for themselves, was yes. At Shadow Rock this past week, Jesus Baronis came into our facility on Friday and was given a stay of deportation on Monday to stay with his family for a year. It was a humanitarian stay based upon his child having cancer. He was able to stay for one more year. We hope that he will make the best of this year for himself and his family. In terms of poetry, in his heart, he was asking the question, can a paradise really, really come into being in the wilderness of my life? And the answer was, this time, was yes. So poetry, not only does it have a justice function, I think poetry is probably best when it has there a justice is. function. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot think of two more opposite papers. <laughs> In terms of the kinds of texts that you're talking about, mm -hmm. the kinds of writing that each text calls for, and the kinds of reading practice that each text calls for. And as I was listening to the two of them together, I was thinking of Eve Sedgwick's very influential article contrasting uh, hermeneutics of suspicion and a hermene hermeneutics of reparation. And, um, you know, just thinking in terms of the way those forms demand each applicant to produce some form of the self in this paper form in ways that are contradictory and diminutive and utterly impossible to fulfill in the correct way, and yet everything is at stake in getting it right. And that beautiful description of, of, of biblical text is a kind of poetry that, that, that generates a kind of openness that continues to speak in so many different historical contexts thousands of years after it's written. I'm just curious to hear your responses to one another and what you, what you think both about it in terms of, of conditions of writing and conditions of reading in terms of how, how your texts relate to one another's. <laughs> I, I, I it's what, impossible. Well, <laughs> I know. What struck me um, about about your presentation, not not only in the in the you know the quality of presentation and the content, but the way from time to time you you interjected, you felt like somehow the process did fall short, and <laughs> and that's that's mm -hmm. the that's the human part that the bureaucracy misses out on you were you were so pointing pointing to that. So I don't see I don't see this as opposite as much as complementary, right? Because 
I think you got to you got to do this. You know, I'm I'm glad that that we have a social contract that that with laws and policy and and people are guardians of that. I'm glad for that. But when they forget to be human and they forget those other pieces you talked about, you know, then it becomes demonic. Yeah, and I, I can't think of what I was going to say. Like, when you're, there was a point when you were up there, and I was like, that's, like, so connected, but now I can't think because I'm scared of these lights. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, there, it's the, the paperwork is, like, it has no gray areas, and it's people in charge. It's like, the policies have been in place for years, and it's just, like, the machine that can't, can't stop itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Sarah, um, one of the, uh, excuse me, the doc, doc, yeah. um, uh, so one of the things that makes uh, Foucault's panopticon what it is, right, is that the, um, the, the prisoners police themselves because they can't, they can't see into the guard tower. They can't see whether they're being watched at any particular time. The, the guard tower is opaque to them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like this paperwork is, very opaque to the people who are filling it out, right? It is how much of that do you think is intentional, right? Because the, the, the prisoners police themselves because they don't know whether they're being watched. They don't understand. They can't read the situation. And in the same way, it seems like you know the applicants for refugee status police themselves um, and, and have to kind of hold themselves to the absolute highest possible standard and put themselves through the ringer, right? because they can't read the situation. If you don't know whether you can go past those four lines, you don't know what happens if you flip the paper over and you finish writing your reasons on the back, right? Then you are gonna work like as hard as you possibly can to, to, to kind of make the most out of that situation. And I'm wondering if you feel like that's intentional or is it just that this, is, this bureaucracy has been built up over time and it, it, that's a kind of secondary uh, effect? You know, I, I would say from my perspective that it's bureaucratic paperwork that's been set up over time that they're not necessarily thinking about like excluding people because I think there is a large portion of redacted information online which technically if you is, again it's like information literacy if you know where to look you can like look at it but I in order for me to kind of find the stuff that I found like I already knew sort of what I was looking for and it was there but I I knew what I was kind of looking for so it's um, to a certain degree, I think it has to do with information management as well, and like setting up infrastructures, but also, um, yeah, I, I think the idea that the, 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 at the same time it is like a, a controlling mechanism that, you know, they're not going to unredact everything, so that they put the whole issue coding book up, up there, like where you know like where you rank, because there's like a ranking of like each, you know, at least for my agency. Um, but yeah, so so there is a certain gatekeeping, I think, mechanism that like keeps people in mind. But at the same time, I think it's more of a broken, not necessarily. Yeah, it's a broken system. Like it, you can't. I feel like you can't stop. You can't stop anything. Like there's no way to, to change anything anymore. Like, um, yeah, background investigation paperwork for like my end is like has little changed since like 1952. So you think of the relevancy, you know, in the last 60 years. Um, I can't speak for the immigration people or how often this changed, but one of the forms is from 2006, which is, you know, I mean, each year stuff. Yeah. I um, was really fascinated by the presentation of the forms, uh, documenting mm -hmm. all of these processes, because it put me in mind of what this um, theorist from Guatemala, her name is uh, um, Elga Martina Salva, and she talks about like the artifacts that comprise the bureaucracies of death. And like what you were showing us today were like some of the artifacts from these bureaucracies that literally determine who lives and who dies, you know? And she was writing about this in context of, you know, genocide in Guatemala and how this was literally like efficiently, each death was efficiently documented, um, which led her to coin this phrase, bureaucracies of death. But like your work is so important in that regard because these are the ways that people are made to live or made to die um, behind closed doors and through the simple filling out of the form. So I really appreciate your work. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of your comment, too. I just think that um, the, the surveillance scholarship like, puts a lot of emphasis on like identity versus identification, like the way people make 
they feel that themselves are, and then like the labels that people put on. But also, like a lot of the whole process is identification, is like yeah, like making you almost in a fact die in the paperwork, you know. And then you like go to adjudications, and you're not even a person anymore. You're just like a file of information. And I know from my end, when I was doing that, you like have to strip out any personal connection to the people. There's like the person could be the biggest jerk you've ever met or like the nicest person you've ever met and the, none of that mattered because there was none of, no like flowery language that could be allowed in there so like it's like it's a weird form and definitely who you become through those forms. I had a, a question Sarah um, you suggested one possible response to this alienating kind of mm -hmm. system of control is critical literacies and I'm just wondering where in, where in the process, which is so locked down, you, do you see any place, do you see any place to ground that for, to, to actually, I mean, what's the pedagogy that would orient some kind of literacy, critical literacy intervention into this process? I'm imagining, um, I'm imagining what it would be like to know those forms before you got to the border and turn yourself in to try to get, a, try to have asylum so that you knew you know what I mean? I'm just kind of brainstorming. What if, what if, what if people had the forms prior to? What if they knew what the forms were and what something about the process? Because part of what you're su suggesting is that the process is overwhelming. Yeah, I guess I think that immigration lawyers, I kind of feel like they're almost doing like critical literacy, except it's only accessible through like a paywall of that. Because mm -hmm. you know these people have access to like the larger systemic like. They know all the forms, but you can't. Well, and plus, those lawyers don't see until after they've filled that paperwork out, right? Oh yeah, uh, yeah I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the health so. process. Yeah, but it's yeah they somehow I don't know. <laughs> so far remote, I just felt like I had I felt compelled to like say something about the forms here. Yeah, so, no, I don't absolutely. know why I get so like worked up over paperwork. Like I think it's probably it's like, in this form and it's like twelve pages. And yeah, just <laughs> something. Like, well, that's great. Right. Thank you. We're, we're out of time. So thanks to both of our panelists. Appreciate it. We're going to have a five-minute break.